fourth grade. I'm back for some more Farmer Boy by Laura Ingalls Wilder. This time we are reading um, the chapter on cob the cobbler, which is starts on page 285. And a cobbler is someone who um, makes shoes for the family. So they don't go and buy their shoes in the stores. They actually have someone come directly to the house and they make the shoes specifically for that person. So they're going to measure the feet and, and the shoes are made um, customized basically for that person's foot. Um, just like the tin peddler comes to the house, the butter buyer came to the house, the horse buyer came to the house, some, some vendors, some people that are selling or buying will come directly to their home. And the, um, the cobbler is one of these people. So mother was worrying and scolding because the cobbler had not come. Amonzo's moccasins were worn to rags and Royal had outgrown last year's boots. He had slit them all around to get his feet in them. Their feet ached with cold, but nothing could be done until the cobbler came. It was almost time for Royal and Eliza, Jane, and Alice to go to the academy, and they had no shoes, and still the cobbler didn't come. So in the winter time, older children had the um, option or the opportunity to go to the academy. That's actually how Franklin Academy got its name. Um, it was a, a place they would go, and they would, they would actually stay right there for a set amount of time, um, girls would learn, you know, how to be a lady um, and different things like that. And boys would learn um, different um, other trades like how to be a shopkeeper and things like that. Um, so that's why they would go there is to get some extra schooling that could not be taught in their one room schoolhouse. Mother's shears went snickety-snick through the web of beautiful sheep's gray cloth she had woven. She cut and fitted and basted and sewed, and she made Royal a handsome new suit with a great coat to match. She made him a cap with flaps that buttoned like button caps. For Eliza Jane, she made a new dress of wine-colored cloth, and she made Alice a new dress of indigo blue. The girls were ripping their old dresses and bonnets, sponging and pressing them and sewing them together again the other side out to look new. And remember, they don't waste anything. Their clothing, up as it ages or as it starts to fade, then they're going to take it apart. They're going to wash it really good and sew it back together, the inside out, so that way the inside now looks fresh and new, and the outside that was faded will now be the new inside. In the evenings, Mother's knitting needles flashed and clicked, making new stockings for them all. She knitted so fast that the needles got hot from rubbing together, but they could not have new shoes unless the cobbler came in time. He didn't come. The girls' skirts hid their old shoes, but Royal had to go to the academy in his fine suit with last year's boots that were slit all around and showed his white socks through. It couldn't be helped. The last morning came. Father and Almanzo did the chores. Every window in the house blazed with candlelight, and Almanzo missed Royal in the barn. Royal and the girls were all dressed up at breakfast. No one ate much. Father went to hitch up, and Almanzo lugged the carpet bags downstairs. So old carpet, they would turn into bags, so that way that would be their luggage when they traveled. He wished Alice wasn't going away. The sleigh bells came jingling to the door, and Mother laughed and wiped her eyes with her apron. They all went out to the sleigh. The horses pawed and shook their jingles from their bells. Alice tucked the lap robe over her bulging skirts, and Father let the horses go. The sleigh slid by and turned into the road. Alice's black-veiled face looked back, and she called, Goodbye, goodbye. Amonzo did not like that day much. Everything seemed large and still and empty. He ate dinner all alone with father and mother. Chore time was earlier because Royal was gone. So they had less people doing the chores, right? So they had to start earlier to make sure they could get them all done. Amonzo hated to go into the house and not see Alice. He even missed Eliza Jane. After he went to bed, he lay awake and wondered what they were doing five long miles away. Next morning, the cobbler came. Mother went to the door and said to him, Well, this is a pretty time to be coming, I must say, three weeks late, and my children as good as barefoot. But the cobbler was so good-natured that she couldn't be angry long. It wasn't his fault. He had been kept three weeks at one house making shoes for a wedding. The cobbler was a fat, jolly man. His cheeks and his stomach shook when he chuckled. He set up his cobbler's bench in the dining room by the window and opened his box of tools. Already he had mother laughing at his jokes. Father brought last year's tanned hides, and he and the cobbler discussed them all morning. Dinner time was gay. The cobbler told all the news. He praised mother's cooking, and he told jokes till father roared and mother wiped her eyes. And then the cobbler asked father what he should make first, and father answered, I guess you better begin with boots for Amonzo. Now wait a second. His feet have not stopped growing yet. 
So this is a surprise for Almanzo that he is going to get to have boots instead of moccasins that would stretch as his feet grew. Almanzo could hardly believe it. He had wanted boots for so long. He had thought he must wear moccasins until his feet stopped growing so fast. You'll spoil the boy, James, mother said. But father answered, he's big enough now to wear boots. And he knows that Almanzo's been doing a lot of work around the farm, and he really follows father's footsteps, right? He really likes to do what father's doing. So father notices this, and he's, you know, rewarding that, that hard work. Almanzo could hardly wait for the cobbler to begin. First, the cobbler looked at all the wood in the woodshed. He wanted a piece of maple perfectly seasoned and with a fine, straight grain. When he found it, he took a small saw and he sawed off two thin slabs. One was exactly an inch thick. The other was a half an inch thick. He measured and sawed their corners square. He took the slabs to his cobbler bench and sat down and opened his box of tools. It was divided into little compartments and every kind of cobbler's tool was neatly laid in them. The cobbler laid the thicker slab of maple wood on the bench excuse me, before him. He took a long, sharp knife and cut the whole top of the slab into tiny ridges. Then he turned it around and cut ridges the other way, making tiny pointed peaks. He laid the edge of a thin, straight knife in the groove between the two ridges and gently tapped it with a hammer. A thin strip of wood split off, notched all along one side. He moved the knife and tapped it till the wood, all the wood was in strips. Then holding a strip by one end, he struck his knife in the notches, and every time he struck, a shoe peg split off. Every peg was an inch long and an eighth of an inch square and pointed at the end. The thinner piece of maple he made into pegs, too, and those pegs were half an inch long. Now the cobbler was ready to measure Almanzo for his boots. Almanzo took off his moccasins and his socks and stood on a piece of paper where the cobbler carefully drew around his feet with a big pencil. Then the cobbler measured his feet in every direction and wrote down the figures. He did not need Almanzo anymore now, so Almanzo helped father husk corn. He had a little husking peg like father's big one. He buckled the strap around his right mitten, and the wooden peg stood up like a second thumb between his thumb and fingers. He and father sat on milking stools in the cold barnyard by the corn shocks. They pulled ears of corn from the stalks. They took, they took the tips of the dry husks between thumb and husking peg and stripped the hugs off the ear of the corn. They tossed the bare ears into bushel baskets. The stalks and rustling long, dry leaves they laid in piles. The young stalk would eat the leaves. When they had husked all the corn they could reach, they hitched their stools forward and slowly worked their way deeper into the tasseled shocks of corn. Husks and stalks piled up behind them. Father emptied the full baskets into the corn bins, and the bins were filling up. It was not very cold in the barnyard. The big barns broke the cold winds, and the dry snow shook off the corn stalks. Amonzo's feet were aching, but he thought of his new boots. He could hardly wait till supper time to see what the cobbler had done. That day the cobbler had whittled out two wooden lasts. The, just the shape of Almanzo's feet. They fitted upside down over a tall peg on his bench, and they would come apart in halves. Next morning, the cobbler <sighs> excuse me, cut soles from the thick middle of the cowhide and inner soles from the thinner leather near the edges. He cut uppers from the softest leather, then he waxed his thread. With his right hand, he pulled a length of linen thread across the wad of black cobbler's wax in his left palm and he rolled the th thread under his right palm down the front of his leather apron. Then he pulled it and rolled it again. The wax made a crackling sound, and the cobbler's arm went back out and in, out and in, till the thread was shiny black and stiff with wax. Then he laid a stiff hog bristle against each end of it, and he waxed and rolled, waxed and rolled, till the bristles were waxed fast to the thread. At last he was ready to sew. He laid the upper pieces of one boot together and clamped them with a vise. The edges stuck up even and firm, with his all the cobbler punched a hole through them. He ran the two bristles through the hole, one from each side, and with his strong arms he pulled the thread tight. He bored another hole, ran the two bristles through it, and pulled it till the wax thread sank into the leather. That was one stitch. Now that's a seam, he said. Your feet won't get damp in my boots, even if you go wading in them. I never sewed a seam yet that wouldn't hold water. So you can see here his cobbler's bench and what he's doing, um, how he's um, making the shoe and how he's using different pieces for the for the um, or different things for the the wood. His all of his tools. Stitch by stitch he sewed the uppers. When they were done, he laid the soles to soak in water overnight. Next morning he set one of the lasts on his peg, the sole up. He laid the leather inner sole on it. He drew the upper part of the boot down over it, folding the edges over the inner sole. 
Then he laid the heavy sole on top, and there was the boot upside down in the last. The cobbler bored holes with his awl all around the edge of the sole. Into each hole he drove one of the short maple pegs. He made a heel of thick leather and pegged it in place with the long maple pegs. The boot was done. The damp soles had to dry overnight. In the morning the cobbler took out the lasts, and with a rasp he rubbed off the inside ends of the pegs. Alonzo put on his boots. They fitted perfectly and the heels thumped grandly on the kitchen floor saturday morning father drove to malone to bring home alice and royal and eliza jane to be measured for their new shoes mother was cooking a big dinner for them and almanzo hung around the gate waiting to see alice again she wasn't a bit changed even before she jumped out of the buggy she cried oh almanzo you've got new boots she was studying to be a fine lady she told almanzo all about her lessons in music and deportment but she was glad to be home again Eliza Jane was more bossy than ever. She said Almanzo's boots made too much noise. She even told Mother that she was mortified because Father drank tea from his saucer. My land, how else would he cool it? Mother asked. It isn't the style to think out, to drink out of saucers anymore, Eliza Jane said. Nice people drink out of the cup. Eliza Jane, Alice cried. Be ashamed. I guess Father's as nice as anybody. Mother actually stopped working. She took her hands out of the dishpan and turned around to face Eliza Jane young lady she said if you have to show off your fine education you tell me where saucers come from eliza jane opened her mouth and shut it and looked foolish they come from china mother said dutch sailors brought them from china 200 years ago the first time sailors ever sailed around the cape of good hope and found china up to that time people drank out of cups they didn't have saucers ever since they've had saucers they've drunk out of them I guess the thing that folks have done for 200 years, we can keep on doing. We're not likely to change for a new-fangled notion that you've got in the Malone Academy. That shut up, Eliza Jane. Royal didn't say much. He put on old clothes and did his share of the chores, but he did not seem interested. And that night in bed, he told Almanzo he was going to be a storekeeper. You're a bigger fool than I be, you drudge all your days on a farm, he said. I like horses, said Almanzo. Huh. Storekeepers have horses, Royal answered. They dress up every day and keep clean, and they ride around with a carriage and a pair. There's men in cities that have coachmen to drive them. Monzo didn't say anything, but he did not want a coachman. He wanted to break colts, and he wanted to drive his own horses himself. The next morning, he, they all went to church together. They left Royal, Eliza Jane, and Alice at the academy. Only the cobbler came back to the farm. Every day he whittled and worked at his bench in the dining room till all the boots and shoes were done. He was there two weeks, and when he loaded his bench and tools in his buggy and drove away to the next customer, excuse me, the house seemed empty and still again. That evening, Father said to Amonzo, Well, son, corn husking's done. What say we make a bobsled for Star and Bright tomorrow? Oh, Father, Amonzo said, Can I? Will you let me haul wood from the timber this winter? Father's eyes twinkled. What else would you need a bobsled for, he said.